you write your second book, and this is what, mid-80s or so, and how did you get to drive up to Walt Disney Studios and decide, I'm going to change the way they're, they're doing these Disney things? Like, <laughs> they're doing them wrong, specifically the girls. They're not all little, poor little girls that get taken care of. Like, what made you decide to do something bold like this? Because you literally just drove up to the studio. I drove up to the studio. I had been writing Saturday morning animation. I saw a Disney feature film that I didn't think was very good. And I thought I could do that better. And so I asked my agent to give them my work, and she wouldn't help me. She said, you know, they don't really read Saturday morning writers over there. So I said, well, I have a book. I'm a legit writer. And so I drove it myself and left it, and left it on the desk. And then somebody picked it up and read it and called me up. When you get into Beauty and the Beast and you're in the, the throes of making the story, um, tell me what about making Belle a little bit differently. I, I love that you've talked about um, the pin drops and her traveling the world because I know that's something that, like, my family is South African and they've gone all over the world and they've kind of... My mom's kind of a crazy traveler, and um, I'd love to know what made you want to decide to give her just a little bit more of an outside view compared to everyone in that town. You know, Belle was, um, for me, uh, I wanted to change the nature of the Disney princess. I wanted to, and this is my own personal private little agenda. I was really subversive, and I didn't really tell anybody that that's what I was thinking, but I was really, really believing that we needed to change that perception for young girls. And Howard Ashman and I sort of, you know, colluded on this character together that she wasn't gonna be about what she looked like, even though she had to be beautiful because that's just what you have to be. And it was Beauty and the Beast. Um, but she, beauty was secondary to her brain and her sense of adventure and her, being a reader. Um, so this is really a character that Howard and I conjured up together. Um, and then we had to push it through, which was rough. Talk about being rough. What happens when they change that scene in particular, like, and turn it into a, a kitchen sequence? That must have been infuriating. I had a little fit, and then I became very unpopular. I became, I was very unpopular, because there was a sort of like sense of, let's just make this throwback, let's just do what we're comfortable with, let's just keep doing the same thing over and over. And I was saying, no, no. Um, and there was a lot more of them than me, so it was a really difficult time, and Howard Ashman was ill, unfortunately, so he couldn't back me up. Um, so it was a hard, hard road, but I didn't stop. I didn't stop, because I really believed it, w it was important to change that, um, and Belle was the symbol of it. What did it mean to you when the Oscars come around, and not only are you just best animated, you're nominated for best picture, um, that must have changed your world, but I think changed Disney as a whole and the way they look at who their heroines are. I mean, since then, we've, we've seen Brave and Mulan and these different female leads that are completely changed from Snow White. Um, what, what did that mean to you, for that, that Oscars in particular? I was, in, I was just in shock mostly the whole time. I was, I was in shock that the movie did so well, that it was uh, so embraced, um, of course, the music was so exquisite that I thought, well, it's the music, <laughs> you know, but the fact that Belle herself, that we actually pulled it off, I think that's what was the biggest, I was just basically in shock. And then when we got the Best Picture nomination, I, I mean, I sort of didn't know what to think, although Jeffrey Katzenberg all along in the editing room was always saying, we're going to get Best Picture nomination. He kept saying that, I thought, oh, he's so crazy. Was it Jeff Katzenberg that read the book that wanted to bring you in? Was he pivotal in bringing you in? Um, Jeffrey was p pivotal. Um, I had been to Disney after I put my book on the desk, and they hired me to write um, a version of Winnie the Pooh, wow. which I did write, and they didn't make. But Jeffrey got, got the script, and, um, and he said, well, we've got to hire her to, to do, see if she has any ideas about Beauty and the Beast. And that's sort of like how that happened. How did then, obviously the success of Beauty and the Beast was, was worldwide, but how did, how did you get involved in like Lion King and that structure and that story? Well, well then or? I was on contract. Okay, so it was... 
So it was just so I was on. Uh, I went to do Homeward Bound. Okay. Yeah. Which I loved. And I was in the middle of Homeward Bound, but then because I was under contract, Jeffrey pulled me off Homeward Bound to work on this thing called King of the Jungle, hmm. which was, you know, not in good shape. Um, and it, but it was an exquisite, you know, the, the art for Lion King was amazing, but they didn't have the story right yet. And they had a script that just didn't work. Um, so they brought me in t- after Beauty to see what I could, what I could do. Um, and so that's how I got involved with The Lion King. Wow. When did all the Disney deciding to make it into musicals, when was that? Was that, gosh, kind of mid to late 90s? I mean, when did they decide to to take these works and put them on stage and kind of a whole new life to them? You mean, oh, after, you mean to go to the stage after they were musical? Well, you know, Belle, Beauty and the Beast was obviously a stage musical (laughs) because that's what Howard Ashman and Alan Menken brought to it because they came from the theater. Yeah. Um, and so it was an, an easy, obviously it belongs back on the stage. And um, some people, Michael Eisner was really, uh, really the, the, the one that made that happen um, to, to put beauty on stage on Broadway. And that was a big deal too, because Disney hadn't been to Broadway yet. And then Aida and... Then Aida. <laughs> what, was some Lion your, King. <laughs> what was some of your favorite experiences along that route? Because that must have been whirlwind to kind of just bring this to a whole bring it back bring disney to to the stage again it was it was a little scary you, you know because it was it was broadway you know and, and we were california cartoon writers you know um and it was a little it was a little uh, intimidating at first but um i so fell in, I so i come from the theater it's where my background is anyway so i felt like i was home i really felt like i was home again and it was a magnificent experience you've always been you were Long Beach girl and then Cal State Fullerton and you've always kind of loved that area um is it is it nice to like you were not too far from Disneyland anyway I know I went to Disneyland almost every weekend with my because everybody had a birthday party there so I grew up going to Disneyland wow yeah um so I've got to ask I grew up mostly with Dennis the Menace when I was really young and then we were just talking about Teen Wolf was something that I remember watching young but we got to know James Hampton Jim Hampton really well and he gave us all of those old shows um, and it was like refinding my childhood how much fun was it creating those those Saturday morning shows and I mean, you did a lot you were the garbage pail kids and all over the place I did My Little Pony <laughs> You know, um, Dennis the Menace, you know, Teen Wolf. Teen Wolf was my favorite. Teen Wolf was my favorite, absolutely. Um, Popples, because they were making animation out of toys. So they have a toy. Okay, let's do like a 60-episode series of Popples, which is about these little bouncy, furry things. Um, and I have to say, that was that was so much fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a small group of like these people we were all like having a good time together. And this was before the internet. So they had all figured out the way to, the, the, you know, they were real technical. So they had figured out a way that you could, you could deliver your script by your, with your computer. So that was like a new de- thing. So I would write the fun little 12 minute episode, which I had just had a, a blast doing. And then just push the button, and there it went. And then I would see it on Saturday morning, like, you know, in three, four months. Fantastic. So much fun. Tell me a bit about um, Alice in Wonderland and Tim Burton um, and the fact that you guys dive so much deeper into that material, that story. You guys add a lot more to the, not just Alice, but I think so many of the characters. I think the queens, um, the witches, everything in there. What was it like sitting with Tim and deciding we want to make this more than just a little girl getting lost in this wonderful world? We want to, there's a lot more to this. I had written it already before Tim came onto it. I had written a first draft for Disney. Mm-hmm. Um, so they came to me and said, do, do you have an idea? Actually, the producer, Joe Roth, came to me and said, do you have an idea for Alice in Wonderland? And I said, no, <laughs> but I'll think of one. And so I thought about it, and I thought, well, 
it's not going to be, you know, first of all, who's our protagonist? And what if she's older and she goes back? So then I wrote that whole version of it. You know, what if she's grown up and she goes back because she's in trouble and needs some help and they're in trouble and so they can all help each other. Um, and then I wrote the first draft and, and uh, that's when Tim came on. Was it magical seeing how much was put into that? I mean, Ugh. the studio got behind it really heavily. And I mean, brought in everyone from obviously Johnny, but like it became a legit blockbuster for Disney, I think, in so many terms. It was interesting because, you know, there was a budget and because of the, of the, the CG characters were really, really expensive. And Tim brought his genius vision to all of it. Um, I adored him and I loved working with him. He was so writer friendly and so respectful, um, which you don't always get with directors, but he was amazing. But because there was this budget issue, Dick Zanuck, the producer, would call me and say, you have to get characters out. They're not going to make the movie. Linda, get my more characters out. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I can't take any more characters out. <laughs> and I remember I went, we still were in trouble. We needed to get more of the movie out. So I went to Tim and I said, okay, how about this? How about we take the pig out? You know, when, you, you, know, uh, you know, the Red Queen puts her, puts her feet on it. She's like, you need a pig here? He said, no, we're keeping the pig. We're keeping the pig. So he was adamant about keeping the pig. So um, it, was, it was a struggle because there was this, this big, you know, budget issue. Um, but then I think the movie, it made a billion dollars. And I think that it surprised them and, a, and had a female protagonist. And that was the beginning of all that. How did um, Maleficent come around? When did you start working on that story? I went to a, sc we were at Comic-Con. Really? And had a, a teaser for Alice. And um, right after we did that little dog and pony show, uh, one of the Disney producers came to me and said, we're thinking about a version of Maleficent. Do you want to do a take? And I said, I don't even know if that's possible. It's, it's Maleficent. She's horrible. She kills a baby. How are you supposed to make her a protagonist? Uh, or likable or care? And, and so I said, I don't know. I'll think about it. So with Maleficent, I, I thought, I, first of all, I thought she was a witch, which she isn't. She's a fairy. I didn't know that when I was watching the animated movie. So then I was watching it. I watched it again, and I, and I was looking at the little other fairies that are flying around, and they have wings. And why does she not have wings? So what happened to her that, that she doesn't have wings and she's a fairy? And so the whole thing sort of unfolded for me because something so horrific had happened to this woman that she was willing to curse a baby. So to, from, from that point of view, I really was like, oh, we have a character now. We have somebody who has, who has something horrific happened to and we can actually understand her feelings about that child. So that's how it opened up. What happened when Angelina came on board and like, how much did she, she seemed to embrace it maybe more than any other film we've seen in a while. Like she, she became her. She was wonderful. Um, she read the first one of the drafts and called me. It's Angelina Jolie. It was like, oh, okay. She said, I never call writers, but I just have to call you and say that, you know, I cried. So I know. So she started being, you know, we started working together on it and we worked a lot together um, on the character. And um, I, I, would, I would write a draft, she would go away to do a movie or something and I would write a draft as per notes and she would read it and go, I didn't like it this way, I want it back the way it was. This happened a few times. Um, so she was, we worked very, very closely and it was a wonderful experience working with her. So much so that you guys are, are working on a, another one right yes. now. <laughs> Is there any, um, Thing you can tell us a bit about what's what's going to happen or what you're what you've got in mind. It's not too you know. Yeah, it, um, it just takes the story further. I like that, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> you told me something interesting before we we jumped on camera. Um, Beauty and the Beast went all the way to to Shanghai and is in Mandarin now. That's got to be mind blowing. That yeah. it's still got legs after all these years. Belle yeah. is still teaching little girls to be bold and go to different places. In China, yeah. in China. Yeah, it was amazing to watch it in, sh in Mandarin, you know, the show, 
Um, and the, the actors were remarkable. And the audience really responded, but I couldn't understand what was going on because it's in Mandarin. You know, but I know it so well, all those who made the, the show know it so well, we knew exactly what was happening, even though it was in Mandarin. It was, a, it was an amazing experience, and it's running there now. Did you grow up watching musicals, or was it more like Disneyland was your play? I did not grow up watching musicals. What was your, what, what got you through, like, what were you reading when you were young, and, and what were you watching? I was, uh, I was, my family, we didn't have a television. My dad was opposed, so we had books. So I was reading literature. That's really pretty much what I was doing. So when you see Belle walking through town reading a book, that's me. I was walking around reading books because I didn't have the opportunity to, to watch television. As far as being able to come and speak here at, at Austin Film Festival to writers, um, what does that mean to you? knowing that you've written TV, film, musicals, you've been on all the different genres and stages to be able to impart your wisdom and knowledge to hopefully next couple of generations. I mean, a lot of people are interested in what you have done and, and worked on. I think it's really important to be passionate about what you're doing and to really think beyond your own personal career, but think about the impact of what it is that you're putting into the planet. You know, really check with your higher self. It's like, what am I doing right now? Is it going to uplift? Or is it just going to be more the same? Or is it actually going to be detrimental? So really, aside from the career and making the money and, you know, it's, it's about, it's why we're artists. Because we are want to change the culture or enlighten or shine a light on something. So that's what I think is really important to, to you know, impress on young writers. Um, to just keep that in mind, because it, it's a hard business, and you have to just keep that in mind. It's like, why am I doing this at all? So why do you keep doing it? What do you love about it, then? Oh, writing, you know, it, it's like breathing. You know, write or die, for me. Um, and the way that the business is going now, you really, it's very, it's evolving. Obviously, all of the outlets are changing, and television has definitely become a really much more interesting place to be. Um, so as a writer w that, that has you know, come through the time, I really see that it's important that we evolve with it or we won't be uh, viable, you know. So I'm writing uh, television now. Back in television. But Back it, in like, television in a world. different way, yeah. <laughs> Did your approach to writing ever change or do you still do the same style of writing do you do you write in the mornings in the night like what is your your way of, of writing I used to be a day writer now you know I get in the morning and I and I I uh, my process is walking walking is my thing walking is how I get the ideas it's just physically moving my body through space and it gets into the zen and um, so walking is my how I how I come up with things um, but, you know, life happens and things happen. And now I'm discovering that I'm doing a lot of writing at night because it's quiet. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm writing, you know, you write when you can. But for me, process-wise, I actually r walk. Wow. I wouldn't have guessed that. Wow. Um, as far as female protagonists and someone who changes the way protagonists are looked from that perspective, what have you liked about seeing other works or other writers and, and female directors? Have you caught anything that's really been like, ah, I'm so glad that this person got to do this. I feel like I helped that along the way. I think it's happening all over. I mean, like, it, you know, you, it's really the female, it's the day of the female protagonist has come. And for me, who's, who has been holding the torch and fighting the good fight and with my machete, I feel like, oh, I can hand that torch off because pe people got it. And younger women uh, are really incredibly talented people and directors, they're doing it. So I can go, okay, you got that? I'll go do a different theme. We had Wonder Woman, we had Captain Marvel, Disney's now owned Marvel. Would you ever jump into that realm to create another female protagonist on that side of things? They don't need me. They don't need you. They don't need me. They got it. They don't need me. So when you, I love how throughout your career people have come to you about, can you take this stab? What's, 
the most recent thing that they've come to you and been like, can you take a stab at this? Well, people are always coming to me and like, well, do you have a take on, because I, I guess I'm known now for like turning an idea upside down or taking another point of view. Um, so I'll get presented with this, you know, classic idea. Do you have an I, idea to turn that on its head? And there's a lot of people doing that. I really want to do new things. I'm really about originality. I don't want to repeat myself. I want to. Uh, I don't want to do another thing where I get another point of view, and you know, I can create a villain who turn a villain into a hero. A hero. I did that. Other people can do it. I just. I'm constantly looking for what's original. Is TV where you want to jump back into, or online with Netflix and Amazon? Do you want to take a stab at those? I think it's the place where, first of all, writers have more power, which would be quite a relief. Um, <laughs> you're sort of like you are the you are the creator and the visionary, um, and in feature films you have to hand it off to the director, and it doesn't happen in television, which is really exciting for me. And also, you can take your time. You know, you can take your time and really develop characters and um, and be more sophisticated. Would you dive into the director's chair? No. Would you stick behind the? I really thought about it, and I've certainly been offered the opportunity. But I realize that I have a that I have a skill set, you know, and I probably wouldn't be very good as a director. I have a skill set. This is my skill set. I'm going to stick with it. Well, it's a great skill set. We've been more than privileged <laughs> to have it. Um, Linda, thank you for the chat. Thank you so much for um, reinventing the game. And um, yeah, thank you for being a part of this. Thank you very much.